So if the first phase is really to just understand whatever passage we're looking at in its original historical context, the second phase is really a natural conclusion from what you derived uh, in the first phase. Uh, let me give you an example. So uh, if, if we're continuing with, the, uh, with the, um, Paul's teaching that women shouldn't uh, braid their hair, uh, we said that the, sig the cultural significance of, of the of braided hair in, in Paul's day had this this meaning of spending an exorbitant amount of money in, into looking sexually attractive. Uh, that's really uh, the foundation of restating it at a transcultural level, which is what you know what we're trying to do here in the second phase. Um, by looking at its meaning in that context, you are restating it transculturally. So really the second phase is, is kind of just a natural move, a natural uh, product from the first phase. Um, if braiding, braiding hair isn't just braiding hair, it's spending an exorbitant amount of money on looking sexually or uh, physically attractive. And so uh, all we're doing in the second phase is kind of coming out with the conclusion to the first phase. Now, think about it this way. If I were to say, don't braid your hair, it's bad, that wouldn't make sense in a lot of cultures. Uh, the, the actual significance of hair braiding in, 20, in the first century wouldn't come across into our cultures. But if you restate it to say, uh, don't spend exorbitant amount of money on the way you look, instead uh, make yourself appealing by uh, doing good works, that's transcultural. That would work whether you're in Haiti or in San Diego or in Japan. It doesn't matter where you're at or what time you're in. You're in. You could. It could be 14th century uh, England. It could be uh, 32nd century. You know, in the future, uh, this is still going to apply in no matter what culture we're in. Uh, the it which stated in a way that it could apply in any cultural in any culture now kind of looking forward here a little bit, it's also kind of vague. I mean, uh, if, if all you tell somebody is don't spend an exorbitant amount of money and uh, time uh, or effort into how uh, into looking physically attractive to the opposite sex, but instead, you know, make yourself appealing by doing good works, that's really vague. I haven't actually picked something to do or not do in my actual life. That's just this kind of abstract principle. And that's what makes it transcultural. Is we we've taken we made an abstract principle that that doesn't have a really a contextual root to it. And so the next step is going to be to really figure out how did that applies in our context. But the reason we restate it from a transcultural level is because as we as we apply it to our lives and different lives, we need to acknowledge what the original concept was, and then say, okay, this is the the general concept behind it um, and so that way we're correctly applying whatever that was into our lives now let me give you an example uh, you know I already mentioned Lot's example when he gives his his daughters to this uh, sexually charged crowd and he's he basically sac he's willing to sacrifice his two daughters um, for the sake of these two strangers that he invited into his home. You can't possibly just move from that example into our culture without understanding it in its historical context. You have to first understand its meaning and then from it we derive a transcultural abstract principle uh, and that is we need to be hospitable uh, as we can be. Uh, we, we, we really need to, we should follow Lot's example in being hospitable. Uh, that's a very abstract concept because that would mean different things in different cultures. In Britain, it's offering somebody tea and, tea and crumpets. In the United States, it's, you know, when, you're, when you have a friend who's, who needs a place to crash, you invite him over even though it might be inconvenience or whatever. So uh, it looks differently, but that's the second phase is, is this abstract uh, transcultural universal principle now I've got two questions here that um, 
that might help you along in this process when things get tricky. And it's just very basic. I think a lot of times once you've done phase one appropriately, you, you've already arrived at the transcultural uh, restatement. But in case you run into difficulty, sometimes I ask myself the question, um, what is the general principle truth that can apply transculturally across time? Uh, you know, we, that's kind of what I already led you through. But sometimes you also want to ask yourself, are there aspects that are not transcultural? Sometimes as, as you're looking at somebody's example, there's certain elements that just won't cross time. They, they won't get... Uh, won't won't be applicable in your time period. So as you're looking at either a, a truth or a um, uh, um, a promise or a prohibition, so, some of those things will have aspects within that are not transcultural. Uh, let me, see, you know, just to give an example, um, when we have the example, the imperative when the Jews have the imperative to go and offer a sacrifice for their firstborn at the at the altar, that there is there isn't really a transcultural universal principle applied there. Uh, you, I don't really see how you can, in a really meaningful, genuine way, um, restate that transculturally, other than to say. Uh, the way God wanted it for the Jews at that time period was that they should go and, and redeem the firstborn. Now, for us, we could make some kind of spiritual transcultural uh, application, say that in some way Christ redeem, redeems all of us. Um, but really, I think if you thought it out carefully, there really isn't a way you can apply that transculturally. Anyway, so these are the kinds of questions you want to ask yourself. And, and like I said, uh, by the time... You know, if you if you do the first phase right, you should kind of already naturally uh, uh, have this uh, resulting transcultural way of re restating that imperative or spiritual truth.